Welcome back. Deaths from opioid overdoses have gone up 200% since the year 2000. It is certainly a sobering statistic of an epidemic, an epidemic, as Sanjay's pointed out, that is completely man-made. Now, as dramatic as those numbers are, there is a debate raging in the medical community and among patients. On one side are people who say, look, we need to put serious limits on opioids, and others who say, frankly, they need these drugs to live a, a normal life, to deal with their chronic pain. You're going to hear from them in a moment. But first, I want to introduce on the stage Dr. Mark Rosenberg and our own Dr. Drew Pinsky. Dr. Rosenberg is the chairman of emergency medicine at St. Joseph's Regional Medical Center in New Jersey. His is the first ER in the country to implement a policy that when patients come in with pain, they are not immediately offered opioids. What reaction, doctor, do you get from people when you essentially kind of try to steer them in another direction? You know, I think it all started out. I'm a doctor. I train to take care of pain and suffering. And for most doctors, when they would open up the toolbox, the medicine kit, to see what medicines are available, opioids were the primary drug that was there. So the Alto program added new medications, new treatments into this toolbox, this medicine box. And there are other options? There are other options. But when patients come into the emergency department, we have several patients who come in who are already addicted or have been addicted to opioids or heroin, and they come specifically to our emergency department because they know they won't have to get treated with opioids and heroin. I have a story about a, um, a young man who came in who had back pain. He had a kidney stone. He came specifically to St. Joe's because he knew he would get alternative treatment than getting opioids. Drew, I mean, you've been counseling slow applause for that. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> but, but I mean, you've been counseling people for Have you ever seen, I mean, in terms of how do, how do opioids compare to other drugs in terms of their hold on people? Uh, they have the highest recidivism. They're the hardest to treat. They give people the most sense of desperation. They don't make it even through withdrawal many times. It's a horrible drug to treat. It's easily addictive. And, uh, you know, it's something we've been dealing with. I, I've been calling the prescription drug epidemic a tsunami. I saw the wave coming it 10 is. years ago. I spent the majority of my clinical life the last three to five years just taking people off opiates who had chronic pain. When you ask them what their pain was, they'd come in and say it's 18 out of 10. They'd never say <laughs> 9 or 10 out of 10. i take them off the opiates. Withdrawal is awful, but most doctors will never see people go through withdrawal. It's not that bad. A week, two weeks later, they would only talk about pain when provoked. When, when asked about it, and they'd say four or five on a scale of ten, mm -hmm. just taking them off opiates. There's not good science that says opiates are effective for chronic pain. They're effective for acute pain, but there are other alternatives. But there's actually no clinical evidence that they're useful in chronic pain. I'm not saying they should be taken away from people for whom it is working. But our science is there, and it's a little like saying, I've got a blood pressure medication, it doesn't work. So let's figure out how to use it. That's like... Well, are you kidding? Uh, I guess it works for some people. Okay, those people should get it. And we shouldn't be taking it away. We shouldn't be dictating clinical practice for a patient and well, a physician. And some people get, get actually worsening pain if they take it. All, it's called hyperalgesia. It's a dirty little well, secret. Let's talk about chronic pain. I want you to read uh, Kay Sanford. She's been in chronic pain for decades, has been on prescription painkillers since uh, what, mid-1990s? Yes. Yeah. Uh, Kay, is a question, I think, for Dr. Rosenberg or both of you. Thank you very much. Um, I've been on daily opioids that have given me a very full and productive life for the last 25 years. And I'm very careful. I have never misused or abused my medication. I am fully aware that there are many alternative, non-opioid uh, things that I can do, which I do. I walk a mile and a half with my girlfriends three days a week. I swim, I pay out of pocket for massages two or three times a month, you know, I'm trying to do it right. And yet, what I know is that there are many patients like me, maybe thousands, tens of thousands, who have tried to do everything right. Let me, let me ask you, what do you say to patients like this? That's Can what I, I want to I, I would say about. good, fantastic. This is a, a, a situation no one would dream of interfering with her treatment, but that is a very tiny minority. 
what, how, what, how, how is it that she is able to it depends on not the genetics, become everyone's different, how they respond to medication, what their potential for addiction is, how they respond to pain. The biology of pain is exceedingly complex. There's another piece in this story, which is adverse childhood experiences that increase the risk for people pursuing opioids. We've had an epidemic of that in this country, too. And this recent pill epidemic may be related to that. I want to say one more thing. Is that we spent a lot of time talking about opioid overdose. There's a lot to be said on this topic. But remember, the most people that die die of opiate plus benzodiazepine. Now that benzodiazepine is a what? Ambient. Ambient. <laughs> not ambient okay. valent valent so, so, so the combination. Now they know you love Percocet. I'm well, no, worried about your beloved Ambien. I, I had a legitimate cause. Of <laughs> I'm just saying. <laughs> just saying. Uh, but the, the point being, the benzodiazepine class and the opiate class together is what is so fatal. And it's bizarre to me that doctors routinely prescribe opiates and benzos together. So, so doctor, what do you say to Kim? Well, we know that opioids are very good. They're powerful medications, and when used correctly, they have a great role. I'd like to tell a quick story, though, about a patient of mine uh, who was a 56-year-old uh, woman who had cancer that had spread throughout her body. And I got a call from her daughter who wanted to tell me that her mom's not doing real well, and uh, she was having a lot more pain. And I wanted to make sure she was taking her opioids appropriately. And the answer was no, she's afraid to give them to her. Look what happened to Prince. Look what oh, happens out there. So as a result, she's suffering. Opioids have a real role in the management of pain. But sometimes they're overprescribed, and sometimes alternative therapies will do as well, and sometimes even better. Mm. I'm so happy that you're doing massage therapy, because that is an alternative therapy that can actually help you deal with your pain a lot better. So hats there off to are, you. There are wonderful alternatives, and I've had acupuncture, which is wonderful. But I think one of the key things that we can do as patients and physicians is work together more carefully and closely. That sounds like incredibly good advice. I mean, I think all the doctors here would Education and yeah. communication. I, I want to meet, uh, want everybody to meet Joe Putignano. Uh, Joe's been on my program before. He's a recovering addict. He's an accomplished gymnast. He was an acrobat who performed in Cirque du Soleil. He's got an incredible story about being in the hospital after a surgery. He was administered opioids, even though on your medical chart, it said you should not get them, right? Yeah, um, on my chart that I signed, it said uh, no opiates, seven years clean. And as I was waking up, the nurse gave me fentanyl. Uh, without my permission, I was kind of asleep and uh, immediately felt incredible. And it triggered that desire, obsession uh, to use more, uh, to keep that high and not tell anyone about it. Luckily, I have a strong program. I didn't relapse, but I had that obsession for many, many months after. Yeah, I was going to say, usually when my patients are re-exposed to opiates, sometimes they have to be, right? They will the obsession will a minimum of two weeks up to several months afterwards, and so you have to plan for that in your program. Again, you guys made a lot of the withdrawal symptoms. It's the wanting and the obsession and the obfuscating, the whole disease process that's activated. Not That's not about withdrawal. That's about the pursuit of the so, desire. So to Joe's point, I mean, essentially, how does somebody like Joe face something like surgery without having access to opioids. Yeah, I mean, there, there, there are some real strategies, and it does take some planning, which Joe tried to do. I mean, he, he was very diligent about informing his doctors about this, said, I don't want to take these medications. But, for example, sh shoulder surgery, uh, giving nerve blocks ahead of time, giving medications that not only help before the surgery and then during the surgery, but then last for quite a bit of time after the operation is over as well. That can help get through that sort of more acute period, giving things like anti-inflammatories. But another thing is, you know, one of the things I find really amazing here, Anderson, is that there's really been no studies looking at the long-term effects of these opioids. As much as we're talking about people taking them chronically, there hasn't really been any studies to look at what happens to the body. And Dr. Lawrence Epstein is here. He's from Mount Sinai here in New York City. And he can speak to that. I mean, I don't know. Do you know, Dr. Epstein, why, why aren't? There's studies out there. These studies, long-term studies, are incredibly complex and very difficult to do and very expensive. Pharmaceutical companies aren't going to pay for them because, frankly, the, the medications are already approved and they have a market. So the non-funded researchers, they can't afford to do it, and there's an ethical issue about trying to study and give a treatment to patients that we have already have good data, there's, there's incredible risk, and yet we have little belief that we're going to get a different answer than the conclusion we've already come to, which is there is minimal efficacy in long-term use. Wow. I, I want to, uh, again, introduce uh, Kim Lauby. Uh, she's a recovering addict. She runs a youth substance abuse program, and I think she's got a question for one of the doctors. Thank you, Anderson. Oh, 
As we uh, well know that addiction is not just limited to pills and opiates, and as the national conversation continues about the legalization of marijuana, are there any studies that suggest that early marijuana use can potentially be a gateway drug for an opiate addiction? Sanjay, you've looked at this a lot. Yeah, well, look, I mean, th there, there's a lot of, lot of studies around this. A lot of people have looked at this, and I think for a long time there was a concern that, look, is this a true scientific gateway? Is marijuana a gateway? What we know is that there are a lot of people who have start with things like marijuana and then move on to heroin or cocaine, and even earlier than marijuana. They may start with alcohol or, or, or smoking. So in that regard, smoking or alcohol could be considered the gateway. But the real question is, does marijuana in some way change your brain or prime your brain in a way that you then need to have, crave something else, like a heroin or, or a cocaine? And the answer to that really seems to be no. That's a myth. It's, it's a myth that's been propagated for a long time, but the, the idea that you take marijuana for a while and now you need to have something more powerful scientifically just doesn't hold up. Dr. Drew, do you agree with that? Um, you know, when I've treated marijuana addicts that are really into pot, it, the problem is it wanes over time, and they then try to find something else to substitute. So it's sort of a substitution, not more than a gateway, in my experience with it. That's somebody who's already the did, did marijuana. You know, this is a rare, it. small population get marijuana addiction, but when they do, it, it can be rough. It can be very yeah. addictive. Uh, I wanted to meet uh, Terry Kroll. Uh, his or her son Timothy overdosed on op opioids. He was overprescribed uh, the drugs by a doctor who was also selling them for cash. Uh, he reported the doctor to the authorities. Timothy died just a few months later. The doctor was arrested. Terry made it her mission to seek justice for her son. She attended the trial of the doctor every day. He was only sentenced, get this, to six months in jail. Uh, thank you for being with us. I'm so sorry for what you've been through. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Um, Dr. Drew, I, I would like to know, how do we make doctors who are responsible for these prescriptions more um, accountable? I, 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 programs like this, I guess. I mean, I know the DEA is very active in that. The one thing I want to say, though, is that all of us, physicians and patients alike, if we're going to take an opiate or a benzodiazepine for more than two weeks, I just say as a rule, just two weeks, more than two weeks, there better be a very good reason. It has to be done patient and doctor, understanding it's a high-risk intervention to go longer. There better be a good reason, and you do it together. Really, I mean, th these things are designed for acute intervention, not for chronic use. And if it's going more than two weeks, both doctor and patient better really think hard about it. Do you, do you agree with that? Uh, uh, you know, absolutely. I, I, I believe that um, we need to really look at physicians who are prescribing large quantity of drugs. And also selling the, those drugs for cash. I mean, that's a huge red flag. And we need to come up with ways to prosecute these, these physicians and to really monitor them and to go after them. This is not what physicians are supposed to be doing. They're supposed to be relieving say, uh, pain and, and relieving suffering. And this is criminal. This needs to be legislated uh, and, and managed. Uh, Bridget Brennan is here. Uh, uh, Bridget is the special narcotics prosecutor in New York City. She's attacking the problem of prescription addiction at the source. Doctors, just as we're talking about, doctors who overprescribe the drugs. Uh, Bridget's office successfully prosecuted one doctor for manslaughter after 16, and this is incredible, 16 of his patients died from overdoses. Uh, thank you so much for what you're doing and, and for being here. We uh, started looking at this when we found doctors who were acting like drug dealers. They were literally exchanging prescriptions for cash. And the, uh, the pills, the addictive pills, were flooding the street corner markets. We found that there was really le little effective regulatory agencies that were looking at it. They didn't uh, seem to have much impact, and it was a public safety crisis. So there's not, I always thought, well, the DEA must be monitoring how many prescriptions a doctor is writing for pills. That's not really the case. The DEA might be monitoring it, but that's not the end of the story. Mm -hmm. Uh, we found that dozens of patients were dying, and really, the uh, when we did our investigations, we would find letters from the health department in the files warning the doctor, uh -huh. but the warnings had no effect. So when we saw nothing else was having an impact, as prosecutors, we were sort of the last line of defense, and we stepped in. There are three ways that we can really address some of these issues that we're talking about. Uh, one is we have to just really decrease the amount of pills that are on the street. Um, there are several states like Washington State and Massachusetts who started an emergency department information exchanges where information is exchanged throughout all emergency departments 
to prescribe 4.7% uh, of the opioids, 17% of the patients from the emergency department get a prescription. But also, uh, we need to uh, legislate against uh, the pill mills and, and those types of things that are creating this problem more and more. So we have a real opportunity out there to make a change, but it really needs to start with keeping the pill count down, uh, legislating against it, and also having take-back programs. Where can you take back your medication if you have if you used all you need, and where can you take it? Many of the police stations you can take it back to, right. but it should be the pharmacies where it's very easy to bring your your medication. Yeah, and, you know, I'm, I'm curious as well. Obviously, Bridget, the store, this particular case seems like an, an obvious example, but in a lot of cases, patients, uh, doctors who think they're doing right by their patients, I think that's where it gets a little thorny, right? I don't think they intend for their patients to overdose. When does it rise to the level of being criminal? When it rises to the level of being um, so egregious. Uh, for example, in the case we prosecuted, the manslaughter case, a doctor was literally exchanging the prescriptions for cash. He had signs all over his office, cash only, and the uh, few would go up depending on the number of milligrams of opioid you would get. Wow. Patients would come, uh, he would be called from the emergency room, told that a patient had overdosed. The patient would come back to him and get a higher uh, opioid prescription. And so it was egregious conduct. It was far beyond just uh, mere negligence or maybe bad judgment. Uh, it was far, far beyond that. And he's not the only doctor we've prosecuted. We've seen it happen. It, it's an easy way to make money for some doctors who are really just drug dealers masquerading. Right. That's not 